open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 22. We've done a lot of weddings here over the years. They're always a blast. Uh, and you know, those of you who have, well, probably most of us have been in a wedding uh, or planned a wedding, you know how much work it is to send out all the invitations and get the food and get all the people and the outfits, the special clothing that they wear to weddings, and uh, what a blessing that is to be a part of that. You know, I have done weddings here where I've had the, the groom, um, really a tough, these guys are real tough, right? They're not nervous. Well, they are nervous when they get up here, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, something about seeing your bride come through those doors. That, that, that first time you see her in her gown, and she's coming down the aisle. And, and, you know, there's nothing like that experience for me to stand with the groom and to see his expression as she comes in and comes down the aisle towards him. What an awesome thing that is. A beautiful thing. You do know, I hope, that God is the one who invented marriage. Amen? He invented marriage so that he could show a picture between our relationship to Jesus, that he's our bridegroom. We are his bride. We're literally engaged to Jesus, and soon we'll have that wedding banquet in heaven with him. What a day that will be. So could you imagine planning a big wedding, spending all that effort and all that time, and nobody shows up? How would that make you feel? Huh? You kind of start wondering, what did I do wrong? Did the invitations go out? Don't people like weddings anymore? Uh, what, what's the problem? And so this morning, we're going to take a look at a story that Jesus tells about a wedding that no one wanted to attend. Uh, kind of an interesting little parable. So if you're in chapter 22, we're going to start in verse 1, and I'm just going to read down through verse 14. Jesus answered, and he spoke to them again by parables, and he said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. So again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who were invited. See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, the fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it, and they went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest, the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers, and he burned up their city. And then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite them to the wedding. And so the servants went out to the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests." But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. And so he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Wow, quite the parable. You know, um, we've gone over many, many parables in the Gospel of Matthew. And remember now, we are in the last week of Jesus' ministry. The last few days of his life before he goes to the cross. And I can imagine some of the things that were going through the mind of Jesus, as he reaches out to make an invitation to people as to who he was and as to what his mission was here on the earth. And so we have 
well, we mentioned this at the beginning, it would be pretty embarrassing, really, uh, to have invited all of your friends and your family and your, all the honored guests to the wedding of your son, only to find out that none of them are going to attend. That would be tough. All the flowers are in place. The reception table is ready. The food is prepared, but no one is coming to the party. Now, here we have a parable, raises the stakes in our story a little bit. This isn't an ordinary wedding. This is the wedding of a king's son, a prince, if you will, and he's going to get married. And um, do you remember, yeah, I know you do, you remember the wedding between uh, Diana and Charles, remember that? Don't suppose there was a wedding in the 20th century that had more exposure than that one. It was all over the globe. And, the, and, and people sat back and they were amazed at the, the splendor of that event aired around the world. But imagine the queen receiving word that morning that no one was coming. TV's been canceled. No one's going to see it and no one's going to attend. Well, this is the kind of story we have before us. This isn't just the person getting married. This is the king's son getting married. Now, I do want to make a, a, just a quick statement here. We go through the Bible in a form that's called expositional teaching. Literally, it means to expose the Scripture, to teach the Bible. And we do that verse by verse. Chapter by chapter, those of you who have been with us for a while, you know this already. And there are a couple of things that we use as rules when we're studying Scripture. I think that all of us should use these things as um, rules. There's three things. There's observation, um, there's context, and there's application. Those are the three things that we seek out as we are teaching and learning and even when you're just reading the Bible. Always ask yourself these questions. What's the context? Who, when, where, why? Those are all very important questions. To keep the Scripture in context with the Scriptures that are around it. You know, there's always that word that we find in the Bible, therefore. Okay? Therefore is a very important word. You ever wonder what it's there for? <laughs> it's there to tell us when we're reading Scripture to go back a little bit to make sense out of what we're reading at the moment. It helps bring things into context. It's all there for a very important reason. And so this first idea that we're going to talk about here this morning is observation of Scripture. When we study, it's serious business. It really is. You know, it's, it's not just casual reading and then walking away and five minutes later you forget what you read. You know, God wants His Word to penetrate us. He wants us to go through our, bottle, our body through our hunger, through our pain. He wants it to go through our emotions and our intellect to penetrate even that and to go all the way down to the very spirit of our being. And you know, there's no other text on the planet that can do that. The Bible, it tells us as God's word that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It can pierce through those things. We all have aches and pains. We all have emotional. We all have thoughts. We all have opinions. But God word, God's word wants to pierce through all that. Because you can know everything about the Bible up here and still miss heaven. Did you know that? It's not about intellect. A lot of people say you're gonna, they're going to miss heaven by 18 inches. It's all up here, but there's nothing down here. Right? Right? It's all about the heart. It's all about the spirit of human beings being touched by God's eternal, unchanging word. And so when we study it, we should take it very seriously to look at a passage as a whole, 
to observe context and any obvious clues that we might find within the passage. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So Jesus gives us the first clue. It tells us in verse 1 that he spoke to them again in parables. He did a lot of that, didn't he? A lot of parables. And they've been awesome to go through. But now as we're approaching this time in his ministry, he's narrowing it down to a specific point that he wants to make. He gives this parable, or if you will, a short story. And the short stories are always designed to teach a moral or an ethical or even a a spiritual lesson. And the context reveals that this is the third parable that he taught um, prophetically of how he would be rejected as the Messiah by the Jewish people. We had the the parables of the vineyard and how they went and they killed the vineyard owner's son. And and these parables that, that were spoken in public with all of the religious leaders around, and not just them, but this the Jews, the people, the public were there hearing it also. And that's why they the leaders would get so angry at the Lord, because the people Just the regular folk like us were sitting there hearing the word of Christ, hearing the word of God being spoken, and the people were locked in, mesmerized by it. And those leaders, they didn't like that at all. As a matter of fact, they hated it, and they tried to plot to kill this man who was a threat to their little power uh, kingdom that they had established over the years. You know, that's kind of how that works sometimes. Fear can be a great motivator to get people to bend uh, to your will. I want you to notice in the first verse that he says, the kingdom of heaven is like. This is a comparison. This is to say this parable is a simile. It's using one thing to illustrate Another, he's describing the characteristics of the kingdom of heaven. And so God is dealing with us in his kingdom as a particular human king did in his kingdom. What we see in this parable is a picture of how God operates in heaven concerning his kingdom. The kingdom of heaven, like a king who prepared this great Wedding banquet. Now, we've looked at weddings in the Scripture. We've talked about the Galilean weddings, um, how important they are to understand that uh, the Galilean weddings are a picture of the bride of Christ, of us being raptured up or rescued. I like to use that word better. We're being rescued from God's wrath. We're being taken into heaven at a moment in a twinkling of an eye where the Bible says we will meet together for the wedding banquet of the king, of Jesus, and we will be his bride. Beautiful, beautiful picture of this awesome thing that God has prepared for each and every one of us. Ancient weddings were spectacular events. They didn't happen for just one day. They would go on for a week. And these invitations would be sent out by messengers. They would send messages before the festivities, and then when the final hour would come, when the time would right, was right, the messengers would be sent out once again. And they would rally the guests to come to the banquet table and to the wedding. And so our scripture tells us in uh, verse 3 that he sent out these servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. They've already been invited. Now he's calling them in. And they were not willing to come. Now, right there, I kind of, my brain kind of stutters for a second, or it pauses for a second to think, who would not want to come to this wonderful event that's being put on by this king? And so, again, it tells us that he sent out... uh, Servants once again. And he sends them with a message. It's not just an invitation. Now it's a message. It's a little bit more detailed. He's saying, look, I got everything ready. Dinner. The oxen have been prepared. Uh, The the table is set. 
the, the steak is on the Barbie. Come on and party at the wedding with us, right? Unfortunately, they make light of it in verse 5. They don't take it seriously. One goes home to his farm and another goes back to his business. This king made several attempts to rally the guests to come. The invitation first, it's very generalized. It's an invitation that is open to all people. And they were summoned to the banquet. And then he sends out his servants again to encourage them to come. But unfortunately, they do not come. They ignore it. They take it lightly. And not only that, but they mock the king by not attending. They're literally mocking the king. Some of them ignored the invitation. Some snubbed him. Um, you know, one thing you don't do, you don't ignore the invitation of a king. Right? Right? I mean, you know, we see every now and then, we see special people, oh, whether they're soldiers in the military or maybe they've done something in sports that's spectacular, and they get to go to the White House. And they get to stand with the president as he acknowledges, you know, their accomplishments. Sometimes we have students. Sometimes we have different types of accomplishments that have happened, but they get this invitation to come to meet the president of the United States. Can you imagine them saying, nah, you know, I got, I got video games to play today. I don't really have time to go see the president of the United States. I got more important fish to fry, if you will. That would be a pretty bad snub, wouldn't it? So this king is experiencing the same thing. Now, what does he do? How do you deal with that? Do you just say, well, we'll just cancel the wedding? I mean, it tells us in the scripture that the king was furious. He was enraged. And then there's a statement here that Jesus said, which is very powerful and maybe raises our uh, interest a little bit in our story. He sends out his army and he destroys them and he burns their city. Now, you might think that to be a little bit harsh. Someone didn't want to come to your wedding, so what do you do? You go burn down their house, right? But I think as we go down through our story here this morning, we're going to find that truly this does fit in with the narrative, the context in which Jesus is teaching. This king knew the ones who had assaulted his messengers. He knew who the ones were that snubbed him. And truly, this is, appears to be an act of vengeance on the king's part. It's an act of justice, if you will, on the king's part. Now, when we do stories like this, it's real easy to start picking it apart and maybe looking, some of these stories aren't really meant to be looked at with a microscope. Some of them are meant to be looked at from a little bit of a distance. I mean, what I'm trying to say is this. Is that who God is in our hearts today? The one who's going to go out and destroy and burn down cities? You would think to yourselves, well, no, that's not our God. But you know what? There is coming a day when vengeance will take place. God will have his vengeance on those who have disrespected, rejected, and made light of his son. So these invited guests, he said, do not deserve to come. This is one of those points. Wait a minute, pastor. You teach us that we're saved by grace and that you cannot ever deserve God's salvation, no matter how hard you try. So what makes these people... Uh, unworthy, what makes it that they're not, they don't deserve to come? And I'll tell you what I think about that. Because they refused to come. It's that simple. Every single one of us has that option in our lives to refuse to come to the cross, to come to Jesus. And we all have been given that. And those 
who reject this offer of grace and mercy and forgiveness, they'll be found accountable for that, for rejecting the Lord. So this king, he, he knows, he's angry, and he is out to get vengeance and justice, if you will. Now, after this takes place, he goes back to his messengers and he says, hey, well, now I want you to go out into the streets. Now, we're not going to worry about these special guests that we have invited. We're going to go out to the street. There are no more special guest lists. The wedding banquet is now open to anyone who wants to come. Open house at the king's wedding banquet of the prince, of his son, and of his bride. And so they're obedient, and they go out. They go out into the roads and the streets and the, and the towns, and they invite whoever to come to the wedding. He went out on the highways and gathered together all that they found. And notice what he says here, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled. So what's this saying? Is it just like we just need bodies to fill the building? Is that what this is? No, that's not what it is. But when God opened it up to anybody, to everybody, you know you're going to have some who are good and some who are bad. But they were all welcome to, to be invited, to be taking part of this beautiful celebration that was about to take place. And then in verse 11, we have a strange verse also. It says, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. And so he said, how come you don't have a wedding garment on? And the scripture said that he was speechless. You know, in ancient times when kings and princes, they were very accustomed to, uh, to make special outfits for those who would attend a wedding. Most of the time, they were just like a white robe that you would put on. It was considered to be a wedding garment that everybody would wear who was invited to the wedding. It was a common practice, especially in a royal wedding. And to go and to say, I refuse to take that wedding garment, I'm just going to go in there in my own outfit, would truly be uh, highly contemptible to the king. It was expected by people that these garments would be worn when they came into the presence of the, of the groom. It was expected it, that they would be worn on this festive occasion, and it was the custom of the person who made the feast to prepare the robes to be worn by the guests. So I guess as you're coming into the wedding ceremony or into the building where they're going to have the wedding, you would be given these garments to wear as you would go in, a beautiful wedding garment. And so he comes in, uh, this man in his common, ordinary dress. He was taken from the highway. He thought he had, uh, he thought that the, his own garment was suitable for this occasion. Yet one had been provided for him if he had just took it, if he would have just accepted it. His doing was expressive of disrespect and rejection of the king and the king's invitation. And so something really interesting happens to this man, and we approach to the second point I wanted to make, and that would be interpretation of a passage that you might be studying. The interpretation, what does this passage mean? He binds him, hand and foot, and throws him outside into the darkness, and it says that the, there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's not a very pretty picture in our imagination when we think about that. Weeping and gnashing of teeth gritting your teeth, if you will, from pain. The king says, bind him. And what happens to him? 
He's thrown into outer darkness. When I was very young, well, I still am kind of very young. No, I'm still very interested in um, astronomy. I'm fascinated by it. I could watch programs and read things and look through telescopes and do all kinds of things. It just, it draws me in. It, it, it shows me how puny we are. But yet God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for puny, for us on this puny little planet that really, you know, you don't have to get too far away before the earth just becomes insignificant and disappears in the vastness of God's creation. Astronomy is a very, very interesting. uh, So I got a, we used to have a subscription to National Geographic. So every month we would get a new one. One of them came out, and on the front of it it said, Where is outer darkness? Now that caught my eye because of the scripture. I've always thought about that, outer darkness. Now when we think about judgment, when we think about eternal punishment, what's the first thing that comes to our mind? Hell, fire, brimstone, pain. But here, we're talking about something quite different, outer darkness. And so when this big fold out in this National Geographic magazine, there's literally a picture of the universe. Now, since that magazine has come out, you know, we've sent up the Hubble, we've sent up a new uh, telescope recently that can literally see so far into the past. It's just phenomenal. Beyond, it's mind-bending to be able to, to look out there and to see the vastness of this. And then at the edge of the universe, it's kind of shaped like this, in the magazine, and then around the edge of the universe, it's kind of framed in, and beyond that, it said, outer darkness. And I thought, there it is. I've always wondered where that was. There it is. It's beyond the universe. It's beyond the, the light of any star. Can you imagine? This article also said that in outer darkness, there's only one atom for every cubic foot of space. Think about that. How many atoms can you fit in a cubic foot of space here on this earth? Billions, perhaps? How many atoms make us up? Can you imagine being in a vacuum of darkness that has one atom for every square cubic foot? That's an amazing thought. To be so far away from light that you can't even see it anymore to be in outer darkness forever and ever. Now, to me, when I look at that, I know that many of the similes, if you will, of fire and brimstone are probably the most agonizing existence that you could imagine being on fire forever and not dying. That would be the worst. Fire and drowning. Well, at least when you drown, you go, but can you imagine being on fire forever? And we read about that in the book of Revelation. We read about the pit. But yet here we're reading about a different judgment or perhaps the same judgment in a different perspective. How many times have you had a situation in your life where you get in a tight spot and maybe you don't know where to turn and maybe you don't have a relationship with God yet. Maybe you're just out in the world trying to figure it out. And circumstances arise in your life to where you're trapped. What do we do a lot of times in that situation? We cry out to God. You know, there's the story of the the boy whose father told him, don't climb on the roof of the barn. Because you're going to climb up there and you're going to slip and you're going to fall to your death. Don't go up there. But you know how little boys are. So the boy goes up, and he's at the peak of the barn, and he's sitting up there enjoying the view, and suddenly he loses his footing. And he's sliding down the side of the roof, and he's screaming, God, help me! But there's this little nail sticking up out of the roof in the barn, and it grabs him by his britches, and it stops him from going over the edge. 
As he comes to a stop, he says, oh, never mind, the nail saved me. We do that, don't we? We cry out to God. And many times when he intercedes on our behalf, we go, oh, never mind, it worked out. I didn't go down after all. I guess I never really thought to think that maybe God put that nail there to save me from, from doom, so to speak. And we find ourselves doing that in life. We cry out to God because we're lost, because we need help. Could you imagine for a moment being in that kind of a situation and you're crying out to God, but He can't hear you? He will never hear you because you are so far away from the light that He can't hear you? You're in outer darkness. Boy, I'll tell you, talk about a, a message that should turn people to Jesus. You would think that that would, right? The idea of being eternally separated from God. That's a terrifying thing, if you ask me. Now, Jesus in his prior uh, parables, like I said earlier, we want to keep things in uh, context here. He's trying to get across the message to those he's speaking to. We know, as I said earlier, he's speaking to the religious leaders, but he's doing it publicly. So he's also speaking to the crowds as well. And looking back on the previous parable, he's talking about himself being rejected uh, by the leaders, by the religious system of the Jewish people. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 21, verse 44, he said, Have you ever read in the Scripture about the stone that the builders rejected that has become the capstone? The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Jesus quoted that Scripture to them to let them know, I'm the stone that you're rejecting. I'm the one that you've been waiting for. This parable also is about rejection of Jesus and his kingdom by these leaders and basically by the whole nation. I, uh, oh my gosh, I was watching a documentary this week on Hitler. And I'm, you know, I, I know some of the surface stuff that happened during that era. Uh, I wasn't around during that time. Some of you were. But this story was about, this documentary was about how he started from nothing and how he became who he became and the ruthlessness of his rule. And I couldn't help but think, man, you know, when you let man have it, when you let man have that kind of authority, that's what happens. Corruption. And you know who he was after? He was after the Jews. He felt like they were subhuman. And this man was able to pollute the minds of the public to support his quest in making these people extinct. It's a terrifying story. But when we, read, when we see a story like that, we think, oh... That could never happen here, right? This is the United States of America. Look what they did to Jesus. They're praising him one day as he's going into Jerusalem on the donkey. And just a few days later, they're screaming, crucify him. We only have one allegiance, and that's to Caesar. They betrayed him. But their minds had been twisted. Their minds were filled with the idea that this man was dangerous. See, it amazes me to think that we're living in a time right now, and I believe we saw it during the COVID era, where the powers that be got to find out just how easy it is to manipulate you and me. They found out just how easy it is to manipulate the population of the whole earth. It should tell us something. It should speak loudly to us. Now, in our story today, you have these people, for some reason or another, whose minds 
have been tainted. They've been darkened. And they're refusing to come to the banquet. It doesn't tell us why. But I'm sure that there was influence upon them to keep them from wanting to come. Something in their mind, something in their thoughts. You know, that's why Paul tells us in the Scripture, it's so important that we renew our mind. It's so important that we change the way we think, that we change the way our brains work. That's what the Word of God does. It renews your mind. It makes you think about godly things instead of evil things. I think there's two sides to this situation. Those who are in love with themselves and those who are in love with God. Did you know you can't have it both ways? You can't. You can't be a self-centered, self-loving individual and have a relationship with Jesus. Sorry. We have to be broken. Jesus said you need to crucify yourself. You need to die to yourself if you want to come and know me, if you want to follow me. And all I hear about growing up as a kid is you got to have self-confidence. Self-esteem. How can I have self-esteem? I'm a corpse. Right? I have died to the things of the world. I've died to self. There is no esteem there. Oh, pastor, you're so narrow-minded. We just want our kids to feel good about themselves. I'm going to tell you something. People never feel better about themselves than when they find themselves with Christ. Right? Yeah. That's true. That's very true. And so Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you got to pick up your cross. you got to deny yourself and follow me. you got to take that pride. you got to take that agenda. you got to take that whole thing, and you got to put it to death. I've done a lot of weddings, but I've also done funerals. And there are some times when there's somebody in the box... And you know what? I don't think they're too worried about what they're wearing or how they look or anything like that. I don't think they care about what happened to their possessions because they're dead. There is no self-esteem. And I look at that and I think to myself, "This this is what it is all about. I have to put my agenda to the side. I have to say I can't go into this wedding with my own outfit. I can't go in there with my own self-righteousness and expect God to allow me to come in to the celebration. It's not going to happen. Unfortunately, we don't write that song. He does. Unfortunately, for some, he's the one that made the plan. And no matter how hard or how bent you are on fulfilling your own plan, It won't happen. It'll leave you in outer darkness. And so the wedding banquet, ready to go. And here's a man that is not dressed in the right outfit. Now, Paul tells us in the New Testament that he has clothed us in righteousness. And that clothing of righteousness came to us because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. It's a gift. You cannot earn a gift. Do you agree? You cannot earn a gift. I might come up to you and say, hey, look, here's a brand new four-wheel drive truck, and I just want to give it to you. And you're like, oh, no, I couldn't accept that. Let me at least give you a couple hundred bucks. No, no, I don't want you to give me anything. How about a buck? Well, if I allow you to give me a dollar for that four-wheel drive truck, it's not a gift any longer. It has to be absolutely free. And so is the gift of God. We receive it by faith. We receive it by trusting in the finished work 
of Christ. That means I no longer need to put on my own outfit of righteousness. I've been a church member for 350 years. I should make it. No, you're not going to make it if you're wearing your own robe of righteousness, or should I say, unrighteousness. There's only one outfit that you and I can wear in order to attend this wedding, and it's the outfit that was provided to us by Jesus when our sin, you know, I have a picture in my office of a picture of Jesus, and he's standing there, and he's got his arm around this guy, and the guy's holding a hammer in one hand and a nail in the other hand. And he's broken and he's weeping and he's barely able to stand on his own. And there's the Lord with his arm around him, holding him. And it reminds me of where we came from. That we were that man, you know, in our past. We were the ones that were weak. We're the ones that drove the nails into him. We put him there because of our sin. He took my sin and laid it upon his own son. And in exchange for that, he took his son's righteousness and gifted it to me. Probably the best transaction in the universe. Right? The best transaction of the universe right there. And so, all through the New Testament... We hear about these robes of righteousness that God has prepared for us. In Galatians 3, 26 through 29, Paul said this, You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, listen, have clothed yourself with Christ. I love that. There's neither Jew or Greek or slave or free or male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Jesus Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, offspring, family, if you will, as heirs according to the promise. You and I are grafted in to God's family. That's what the Scripture teaches us. Revelation 19.9, the angel said to John, write, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And then he added, these are the true words of God. We've been invited to this ceremony. We've been invited to this celebration. Some will accept some will reject to their own peril. You know, I've done a lot of crazy things in my life, and maybe some of you have too. As a matter of fact, I thought I was having fun out there. <laughs> but really, all I was doing was destroying myself. Isn't that weird how we call that partying? Let's go out and party. Let's go out and destroy ourselves a little bit. What a blast that's going to be. How deceived can we be? How foolish can we be? Now, for me, I think it was because I felt like I was immune to all consequences. You ever feel like that? Maybe you didn't say it, but perhaps by our actions, we, we acted like it. But I'm going to tell you something right now. I have never enjoyed my life so much as being around God's people. Yeah. Being here with you on Sunday is the highlight of my week. Yeah. And I know a lot of you feel the same way. We come together and we celebrate God's righteousness that he's clothed us with together. And we come to realize, you know what, there might be somebody in our little group this morning that's wearing their own outfit. There might be somebody in here this morning that does not wear the right robe. You're still wearing your self robe. You're still trying to show God that you're worthy. And you're falling and stumbling and your life is in disarray. 
and you're wondering why. You have to have on the right outfit. You have to die to yourself. The very last verse that we're looking at here this morning, many are called, but few are chosen. The call goes out to everyone. I love that. Now, these Jewish people, they thought they were the only ones that were going to be part of God's kingdom. Us Gentiles, we were just dead. We're dogs. We're worthless. We're subhuman. And you know what? God said, no, that's not the way I planned it. Matter of fact, you can look all through the, oh, even the Old Testament, where God tells Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because of you. We're all going to be included in this. But God made a promise to Abraham. He made a promise to him that his, his nation would grow and multiply like the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. And that through that group of people, his promises would be fulfilled. That's nothing to do with how good these people were because they were actually the opposite of good. They did everything in their power to reject God and to worship idols. If you're in here on Wednesday nights, you know how we're learning about that. This invitation has been sent out to the highways, to the byways, to the bad, to the good, to those who are broken, to those who are tired of running. And so this morning, as I close, I just want to let you know that if you feel this morning like you're not wearing the right outfit, you can change, not literally, your outfit before you leave here today. Many are called. The gospel message goes out. The invitation is made to all. But it's only those who respond to it by putting on the appropriate attire are the chosen, the ones to attend the wedding celebration. And so we come to that last point, application. This passage is teaching us that God has extended his invitation of the good news of Jesus Christ to all of us. We can all be part of his heavenly wedding celebration. The only requirement is that we come to the wedding dressed in the clothes that God has provided and not us. Isaiah warns us about attempts to gain righteous standing before God by putting in our own clothes, our own self-righteousness. Isaiah 64, 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. That's how it's seen by God. Maybe not in my perspective. I've worked pretty darn hard to try to look pretty righteous, right? But God said, no. You got the wrong outfit on. I want to go to that wedding. How about you? I want to be there for that event, right? I want to be ready when the trumpet blows and in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed and this corruption is going to put on incorruption, right? I'm going to get a brand new body, an eternal body. A lot of you are going, yeah. Oh, man, all them joint pains and the sags and the <laughs> wrinkly skin and it's amazing when you, when you watch any kind of TV at all because there's so many commercials about take this and you'll feel young and do that and you'll look better. And do. You can't hide it. You can put lips... No, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Why don't we have the worship team come on up? <clears throat> before I get in big trouble. Galatians 3.6 says, if we consider Abraham, this is what we learn, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So here's my question this morning. Have you clothed yourself with Christ? Have you come to God on his terms and not your own? Or are you still trying to do it your way? Have you accepted the robe of righteousness provided by Jesus? Or am I dressed up in my own spirituality? 
He's provided us everything we need, you guys. The Bible says he's given us everything we need to live godly lives in Christ Jesus. Already given it to us. It's not yet to come. It's available. It's right there. If you're in here this morning and you're wondering about your spiritual relationship with God, are you wearing the wrong outfit? I want to invite you to hang out, maybe get some prayer. You can rectify that before you leave this room today. And I'm going to tell you something, time is short. So if you're sitting there thinking, I ain't walking up there in front of everybody to get prayer. Well, no one's going to watch. We have a couple over here that want to pray with you. And I know just about everybody in this room would say, if you need prayer, go get it, right? It's that time. We don't just come to church to get an emotional pump, right? We come to church to get our spiritual needs met. So let me encourage you this morning, if you need prayer, take advantage of that before you leave today. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for our time today. And I know, Lord, that for the most part, those of us sitting in here, we understand that we can't come to you in our own righteousness. But Lord, there may be someone here this morning that doesn't, or perhaps their eyes have been opened today. And I want to ask you, Lord, that you would touch them, that you would move them, Lord, that you would encourage them, put your pride aside, put your doubt away, come to him by faith and receive that free gift. And Lord, for the rest of us, as we see the day approaching, help us, Lord, help us to be a light in a dark place. Help us to be encouragers of those who are down. Help us, Lord, to love on those even who are unlovable because you did that for us and you live in us and you give us the capacity to do that. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.